Dr. Swaminoff is a computational biologist. He's a physician, academic, and author. He's an associate professor of laboratory and genomic medicine at the Washington University in St. Louis. He's published over 150 articles. And he's a rising star, I think, in the area of faith and science with his Peaceful Science blog and his recent book, The Genealogical Anatomy of the Surprising Science of Genealogical Ancestry. Dr. Swamidas was recently elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science for his distinguished contributions to the field of deep learning, which he talked about last night, uh, and for his extraordinary public outreach promoting an understanding of science among faith community. Uh, so AAAS is the world's largest scientific <clears throat> society and the publisher of the, the science family of journals. Election as a AAAS fellow is among the highest honors in science. So with this, uh, I'd like you to welcome uh, Dr. Swamidas. First of all, thank you for coming. It's really been a pleasure spending time with so many of you over the last uh, last 24 hours. It's been kind of a whirlwind intense. I've, I've particularly enjoyed spending time with the students. So thank you so much. I mean, I get to have dinner with you guys. And I, what I love about it is just, like the questions are so good, aren't they? <laughs> to kind of sit there and not necessarily know the precise answer right from the beginning and be able to kind of work it out and think about it. Maybe not even have the right answer at the end of the story too. <laughs> and kind of wrestle with them together. So thank you so much for just uh, welcoming me here and being able to uh, include me in your conversations, uh, you know, just across the entire spectrum of this campus. I really, really appreciate it. We're going to be talking today about Adam, Eve, and evolution. Are you, can you guys be able to hear me OK? I'm not sure OK if it's kind of coming out in or out. Um, so I'm a scientist. Um, I'm also a medical doctor. I work at WashU. I'm a professor there. Um, I was raised in a young earth creationist home. Uh, we, you know, I believe that the Earth is really young, and that that what really seemed to be a plain reading of Genesis was true. And when I was also drawn to science, I was really made for science, and so I'd be encountering the scientific world often, and kind of hearing about the age of the Earth and evolution, and I really perceived a strong conflict there. And I struggled with that for years. So this book, in many ways, really comes out of that struggle of trying to work through this and to make sense of really, is there a way to really hold scripture in a way that has integrity, that isn't like a wild change to my reading of Genesis? <laughs> um, and that also kind of makes sense in light of what I'm learning in science, or at least what scientists say. I think what really made it particularly difficult is when I started to become a biologist, went to graduate school, and I started to see the evidence for myself. And I realized that this wasn't merely an argument being made uh, by atheists back and forth. This is just, uh, uh, you know, really a fairly straightforward, plain reading of the genetic data as common descent. And so how do I deal with this? How do I fit together two seemingly entirely contradictory plain readings, <laughs> so to speak? I mean, they really do seem like different stories, right? I'm not the, I'm not the first person who's wondered about this problem, for sure. Uh, there's one story where it seems like all of humanity arises from two individuals. And there's another story where we arise by a long chain of descent from common ancestors with the great apes. Which of these two stories is true? You know, how do we make sense of that? That's been a place of where I would say the primary conflicts have been for, for science and many Christians. Uh, we're coming up pretty soon on the 100-year anniversary of the Scopes trial, right? If you go back 100 years ago, um, most fundamentalists uh, were not quite like the fundamentalists today. They were largely old Earth creationists that believed that the Earth was old. They had no problem with evolution in the animal kingdom. They had no problem with any evolution in the plant, plant kingdom. The real place where they felt the need to you know, put a line in the sand and draw, and to really you know, hold to something they thought scripture told them was really when it came to human evolution. That's really where the issue was. And it wasn't merely about um, a particular view of scripture. They were also really concerned about how uh, 
an evolutionary understanding of the world, when that's only the thing there, how that might lead to really undermining human rights and dignity. At that time, remember, eugenics, eugenics was really big and really being supported with evolutionary science at times. I mean, that's not, that wasn't always valid. Actually, a lot of it was really bad science. Some of the early geneticists, in fact, were arguing against eugenics, but still in the popular consciousness, evolution was being used to justify some pretty horrible things, right? They were concerned about all that. And so this is like a, a conflict that goes really deep. Now, I need to pause for a moment and explain to you a little bit more about what I think people have meant by Adam and Eve. There's many ways to understand Adam and Eve. And also, I've got to explain to you a little bit more about what I mean by evolution. Because there's certainly different ways of understanding evolution that aren't even really good science and maybe are a problem. And there's certain ways of understanding Adam and Eve that aren't very you know, connected to what the Bible says or how Christians have historically understood it. But this is what I mean by them. So I mean, first of all, Adam and Eve with these three things. And I think this is how most Christians through history have understood Adam and Eve, as two people that were created without parents uh, less than 10,000 years ago, so in the relatively recent past, and they're ancestors of all of us, okay? And you can ask, like, which of these is most important? Um, you can judge that from looking at history and kind of seeing what has been most important to Christians. Like, you could say pretty easily that the most important of these is that actually being ancestor of all of us. After that uh, would be probably being created without parents, and then after that would probably be recently. The, the least of them is like the timing issue, importance. But what I'm saying is by Adam and Eve, all these three things together, okay? In terms of evolution, what do I mean? I don't mean some godless process out of which we arise. I mean, science doesn't really tell us if God was involved. What I'd say is that it really seems that we share common ancestors with the great apes. And the reason why it seems that way is because we do. Now, some people will say, well, the, you know, it couldn't have been a purely random accident. That's fine. God can providentially govern, you know, the cast of lots in a gambling casino. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he can manage random mutations. Like, he knows what's going to happen. Even if it looks random to us, he knows what's going to happen. Um, and so it, we're not making any sort of claim that there was some sort of intrinsic um, uncertainty or accidentalness to this in a theological sense. It's just that from a human point of view, we couldn't predict what would happen, and we got here through this process. But it was providentially governed somehow by God. Does that, does that make sense? And if you think that God intervened at points, that's fine too. Science doesn't really tell us whether or not God intervened. It just doesn't tell us that answer, that, you know, the answer to that question. But it does really seem to be providing pretty strong evidence that we share common ancestry with the great apes. And also, there seems to be some pretty good evidence uh, from several lines, actually, that, um, you know, that if you go back within the last 100,000 years, say, the human population, you know, our ancestral population never really drops down to just two people. It's always thousands of people more. So we arise out of a population, not a pair of individuals. So that's all I mean by evolution. Are you guys following me? So uh, that, that's pretty neutral. Like, if there's a way to make all this work, that, that would be a good thing. There isn't anything that's intrinsically a, uh, should be a challenge to our faith and how I've described evolution. And in here, how I've described Adam and Eve, too, um, you know, you, you can see that directly in Scripture. That's pretty close to how I understood things as young earth creationists and actually how most Christians through history have understood Adam and Eve. Now, here's the key thing about the last 150 years, something that almost everyone agreed on and almost everyone was wrong about. Everyone believed that all five of these things could not be true at the same time. That one of these things, at least, or maybe a few of them have to be wrong, so you have to pick and choose. And so um, atheists would say, well, Adam and Eve, that's all just a myth because we know evolution's true. So that, that solves the conflict, right? <laughs> a lot of Christians would say, well, evolution's false. <laughs> and so they're, you know, and, and Adam and Eve are true. And I mean, I guess that solves the conflict too, but in a way that kind of denies one half of it, right? So they're still not saying that all of them are true. So everyone from the atheist to young earth creationists is agreeing that all these things can't be true at the same time. And old earth creationists kind of find themselves often caught in the middle, and sometimes theistic evolution is true, uh, theistic evolution is too. And um, they're trying to find some sort of way to manage this, and it would usually be done by um, denying one or all of these points on the Adam and Eve side. Um, there's actually a fairly large group of Christians that decided that maybe Adam and Eve isn't really necessary to theology, and we should just get rid of it and kind of move to some sort of no-Adam theology, 
it's all fairly recent. It's really within the response to science and like higher criticism, really within the last 150 years. So everyone has really thought there's a conflict and resolved it in one way or another by uh, denying or kind of letting go of some of these propositions. The big thing that my book really contributed, my work really contributed, is the surprising thing that actually all five of these things can be true at the same time. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Now it makes you wonder how and why, right? <laughs> And what I'm going to do. But let's be clear about this. You don't actually have to agree that evolution is true to be able to recognize it's not in conflict with Adam and Eve is laid out here. You can still, I mean, I'm not trying to argue with you that evolution is true. If you want to know why I think it's true, I'm happy to explain it. That's not what this is about. I'm just saying that if it were true, if you want to imagine an imaginary world in which evolution is true, does that mean that Adam and Eve couldn't be there because it's in contradiction? No, it doesn't. It's not in conflict. And it goes the other way, too. If you're here and you're like, you know, I'm a Christian, I think it's all a myth, it's nonsense to think about this, or I'm an atheist, I think it's nonsense to think about this that way, well, okay. You don't have to believe that Adam and Eve were real to recognize that it isn't in principle in conflict with uh, evolution, right? So let's kind of wa walk into this. I mean, I'm going to give you a scenario that shows how all five of these things can be true at the same time. Um, you're kind of curious how I'm going to do this trick? Well, um, what's really critical uh, to understand about the Genesis tradition, or the way how people have, most people have read Genesis, is that it doesn't actually give you the whole story. Uh, there's lacunae or gaps in the story there, that people fill in in different ways. And one of those gaps is this question mark, which I call the mystery of what's going on outside the garden. A great deal of attention is put to explain that the garden uh, of Eden, where Adam and Eve are, and you know, in the Fertile Crescent somewhere, that, that it had borders, right? It didn't extend across the entire earth. And if we're going to take a literal reading of Genesis, the, the teaching of Genesis is also that there was death outside the garden, because that's how death comes to Adam and Eve. So if maybe if there was no death in Adam's world, that maybe that's true within the garden, but the actual teaching of Genesis is across the world. There, there was you know, animal death and death among people even everywhere. But the question then becomes, like, were there people outside the garden? And people have been wondering about that for a very long time, it turns out, long before evolution. One way to read this is kind of like maybe a naive young earth creationist reading. There are less naive readings too, where you kind of basically say, well, um, scripture doesn't talk about it, therefore it doesn't exist. And you know, it doesn't actually clearly say that there were people across the globe, therefore there was no one. And you can certainly take that view. I mean, I, I, I could say that you know, with a little bit of you know, squeezing, you can make that consistent with scripture. There's definitely some troublesome passages. That's one sort of traditional reading of Genesis. But another one is to say that there, there were people outside, that Adam and Eve, when they fell in the garden, they exited the garden and encountered people out there. And their offspring ended up in, in a breeding of those people outside the garden, and they quickly became ancestors of everyone across the globe. Isn't that cool? <laughs> And now you can see how this actually resolves that paradox if this works out. We haven't worked out the timing issue yet. We'll get to that in just a moment. But you can see how God could create an individual couple within a larger population, right? And that population interbreeds with other. That's like kind of the story of one lineage that, out of which you arise. But then there's these people outside the garden that we descend from too that God created by this process of common descent. So in the same way, there's no contradiction in saying I descend from my father and I descend from my mother. <laughs> There's no contradiction in saying that I descend from Adam and Eve, who you know, God created without parents, and I also descend from people outside the garden that God created by some process of evolution. Does that make sense? That solves that conflict, you, both of them really. How it could really be true that, we, that Adam and Eve were created without parents, and we also share ancestry with the great apes. Now let's talk about a little bit more what's going on here. Now you might be thinking, okay, so if this is true, that means that um, that it's got to be really far in the ancient past, because mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam, they're like over 100,000 years ago, right? Either that or you can maybe say that scientists got that wrong. I don't think that that's right, the right direction. I think scientists are right about that. Well, what's going on here um, is really key to understand, and there's a lot of time spent on explaining this in my book, is that there's a difference between genetic and genealogical ancestry. We tend to conflate them and think that they're the same thing in our current moment. Um, but that's, that's not the right way to think about it. The reality is that, that genetic ancestry is really, really weird. It doesn't work the way you think. I'm going to show you that in this example here. This is kind of a surprising example I'll give you about genetic ghosts. 
Um, but um, in contrast, genealogical ancestry is an ordinary understanding of, of ancestry. So what is genetic ancestry? Genetic ancestry, you're a genetic um, ancestor of someone if they get by direct descent pieces of DNA from you. You follow me? However, um, you're not their ancestor, their genetic ancestor, if they don't get DNA from you. Now, on the other hand, they're your ancestors, or you're their ancestor, or they're, you're, they're your ancestors if you arise by genealogical descent from them, like a chain of reproductive acts. So think about it this way. So you have a parents, right? They're your ancestors. They're both your genealogical ancestors because you both arise. I mean, I'm talking about your biological parents. You may not even know who they are, but everyone has two biological parents for the most part, right? <laughs> who knows with modern technology, there might be some boundary cases, but you get the basic idea. <laughs> um, we have two parents, even though we don't know who they are. Um, they're both 100% your genealogical ancestors, right? But they're only 50% your genetic ancestors. And why is that? Because only 50% of your DNA comes from your mom. That's a little bit more on average from your mom than from your dad and 50% from your dad, okay? Now you have grandparents now too, right? Grandparents, and you can see that here too. So this is you, you have 100% of your genome, and this is your mom and your dad. You get 50% here, that's why it's gray, it's like a 50% gray. And then these are your grandparents right here, you see that? And so you got about a quarter percent from each one of them. It's not exactly a quarter percent because there's a little bit of stochasticity and you, know, you kind of inherit, inherit DNA in big chunks. Not, um, it's not, it's like a discrete problem. It's not actually continuous. <laughs> and that actually becomes important in this. Um, and then you know, your great grandparents, there's eight of them. And it's about, about eighth of your DNA you get from each one of them, right? You can kind of go back and back. And so, and this is like simulating, you know, the autosomal part of the human genome here. You go back fairly recently, going to back maybe about five or six generations back, and there starts to be these people that appear that are green. And so I just colored them differently because these are people that are really your genealogical ancestors. You arise by a direct chain of ancestry from them, you following me? But you get zero DNA from them. Not nearly zero, literally zero. Precisely zero. Because remember, DNA is inherited in chunks. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's really, really recent. <laughs> And what's crazy here is that this isn't like the exception. You go back about 10 generations. This is just about 300 years. The majority of your ancestors give you no DNA. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> This is like one of the most non-intuitive things in biology that I, I remember. I mean, I've presented this to biologists many times. And um, population geneticists who are experts in this space, they all kind of talk about this. Like, yeah, this is just common knowledge. Of course that's true because they've thought about this a lot. But I'll tell you, the vast majority of biologists you talk to, this is kind of like one of those specialized areas where it's like well-established. It's very easy to demonstrate and show this. But if you haven't thought about it deeply, it's deeply non-intuitive, right? <laughs> And you'll be surprised. And so there, it's just been really funny to watch at times in this like enjoyable sort of way. I mean, like the double take <laughs> that you get even from biologists in the same way you get from a room of, uh, of, um, of, non, uh, of non-experts too, of just kind of realizing, oh yeah, that's just the weird ways in which genetic ancestry works. <laughs> now, of course, the Bible doesn't know anything about the weirdness of DNA. They didn't know what DNA was back then, right? <laughs> They had a general sense of biological inheritance, but they had no idea how it was formed. I mean, DNA was only discovered, you know, less than 150 years ago, right? You know, around 100 years ago, depending on how you count it. And we only figured out the structure, like maybe about 60 years ago. And, you know, it's come to really define modern biology, but it's a very recent thing. And so when they're writing about or like anyone, even if they use the word genetic, which at times have had meant something different within the theological context, they were never really meaning to say that the Christian teaching is that Adam and Eve are our genetic ancestors, <laughs> right? Merely that they would be our universal ancestors that all of us descend from them. So that was like one surprising thing that people didn't know about. <laughs> Uh, there's more to it, too. It turns out that the way how gen genealogical ancestry works is very different than genetic ancestry. Our, like our first genetic common ancestors arise you know, fairly early, like you know, over 100,000 years ago. That's a, this is a long time ago. Our most uh, common, I mean, our common um, and most recent genealogical ancestors of everyone alive today arise really recently. Like some estimates say that around 2,000 years ago is when the most recent 
people are that are ancestors of everyone in this room, for example. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> It's just not the ancestry that's being traced with DNA. Um, it, it's, it's if you consider all the connections, including the ones that are not covered by DNA, then you start to find out that we actually become, we get those universal ancestors really just very quickly, just in a couple thousand years. And moreover, um, actually, if you go back just a little bit farther than that, the majority of people across the globe, like maybe 3,000 years ago, the majority of people across the globe 3,000 years ago are ancestors of everyone alive today. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so this is no longer um, like, you know, this thing of like, oh man, like, you know, you got to figure out exactly where Adam and Eve were a common ancestors. It's a hard thing to do. It turns out it's actually just becomes out impossible. It might require miracles for Adam and Eve not to be the ancestor of everyone. <laughs> So one of the things that I did in my scientific work was actually look at this question that kind of arises in theology, and we're allowed to take questions from theology and science and kind of approach them in a secular and neutral way and think through, well, if, you know, what we care about is not just everyone alive today, but everyone in our current theological era, you know, before Paul writes Romans, before Jesus' ascension and all that, or, you know, at that, you know, switch between the era before Jesus to after Jesus. So let's say pick the date of like AD 1 and think about everyone who lived from 81 on and across the entire globe, including the Americas and Australia, what's the best estimate for when the most recent ancestors might arise? And they arise more recently, they rise around, you know, rise around 5,000 years ago. <laughs> I mean, they'd be kind of like just a few of them, but by uh, about 6,000 years ago, the majority of people across the globe would be ancestors of everyone. <laughs> and of course, that includes all of their ancestors too, so you can go back any time and you know, prior to 6,000 years ago. I don't know of anyone who thinks that Adam and Eve is more recent than 6,000 years ago, which means that if Adam and Eve were real people in a real past, our best scientific estimates are is that they would be ancestors of all of us, even if they were as recent as just 6,000 years ago. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and we kind of went in like this fell swoop from going like, man, we have to choose between all of these things. So I already showed you how common descent B can be true and also de novo creation, Adam and Eve being created without parents, how they could be um, now in the relatively recent past too, right? And ancestors of all of us and also evolution, that evolutionary story could be true. And so what I'm proposing here is some people say, well, that, if it's not actually seen by science, it's not very real, or uh, you know, if it's not in scripture, it's not real. It's, it's something a little bit different going on than this. It's kind of like how all stories work. Um, what, what I'm saying is that Genesis is giving us a sacred history that's telling us a true story about things that happened in the physical world that have theological significance, about a garden that God divinely created and placed two people within it um, that were the first two people in a covenant with him. And those two people fell in a way that in, ended up impacting everyone outside the garden. And so that's a true story. Um, and all we're just saying with that story is that one of the things that people worried, wondered about is whether or not there were people outside the garden. Like, where did Cain get his wife? Now, maybe he married a sister, but, or maybe there was actually people outside. And science just tells us, well, actually, you know, it makes a lot of sense to think about people being outside. It doesn't really actually change anything about the theological story. It just gives us insight into that mystery. And that's really ends up being the only way in which science really ends up pushing on the traditional account. Now, in science, what's going on is that, you know, Adam and Eve, um, it's still the same physical reality, but science doesn't tell us everything about the past. Um, and so Adam and Eve are just kind of falling into a blind spot. We don't expect to see any evidence, certainly not in our genomes for Adam and Eve, really. So we don't find it, and you know, it's just because we don't have the way to actually interrogate every single sort of like localized, detailed thing. I mean, for the same reasons that we can't, you know, marshal scientific evidence for or against the virgin birth of Jesus, we can't really do the same for Adam and Eve. And so it's just something that, well, okay, maybe it's consistent with science. We don't think anything in science tells us it's true, but it's not actually something in conflict, right? It kind of moves. Adam and Eve from that column of conflict with science into that column, like kind of alongside the virgin birth. Well, like maybe science doesn't give you reason to believe it. It's going to really come from other sources or warrant that you might believe such a thing. Um, but it's not in conflict in the same way everyone had thought for so long, right? And so then we kind of have like the same common underlying reality in which that they're just two different stories being told. And we always tell stories that way. <laughs> like 
interesting stories don't tell you every detail of the university about the entire world across every place. That doesn't make any sense. Those are boring, long-winded stories, right? That never even succeed in telling you everything anyways because you normally check out anyways early. What happens is to tell a good story, you kind of focus in on the part that's important, right? And you leave out the parts that aren't important for the purpose you have for that story. I can tell you about my origin for my family and I can tell you about the story of my mother and how I rose from her. And that would be one story. I could tell you the, another story that talks to you about, starts with my dad <laughs> and how I rise from him. These would be very different stories that eventually meet up and become the same story. But uh, if my mom and my dad had lived in different states, that's not a contradiction. That's just, we're talking about different things. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that one is fictional or mythological and another one is true. It, it just means that they're talking about different things that are in the same physical world. Do you, you get what I'm saying? And this is honestly how all stories work. They're selective and they kind of focus on the part that's important. And so what we find out here is that I think you can end up leaving the coarse parts of the Genesis account entirely intact and untouched by evolution. And you can make space for evolution in a way that leaves it essentially untouched. I mean, it's not the whole story. It never was the whole story. That would be the mistake. But what scientists have been learning in nature could actually really be true. And, uh, and really uh, just, uh, you know, just happening alongside what Genesis talks about. All right, so what's happened with this? One of the really cool things about how my book worked out is I got an opportunity that's very uncommon <laughs> to be able to workshop this with a large number of scholars outside my field. So I'm a biologist, I'm a physician, I am not a theologian. I'm not a philosopher, I've never gone to seminary. And um, I often tell people, I'm not really sure why people care about how I personally interpret scripture. <laughs> Guys, I'm not, I'm not any better than you, really. Um, but what I did get to do is gather a whole bunch of experts like that together <laughs> and kind of pitch this idea to them and say, hey, does this actually solve the problem that you're dealing with? So in the course of actually editing my book, there had to have been over 100 scholars that gave comments back to me on my book. And I used to adjust it. So I kind of got like this vicarious theological education out of it. <laughs> and then not only that, um, and so these are people that some of you might know. This is like William Lane Craig. This is Ann Gager from the Discovery Institute. I mean, I'm not really ID. I have no problem with evolution. But I was still engaging with people across the spectrum. This is Ann, um, A.J. Roberts from Reasons to Believe. This is Richard Averbeck from um, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's actually has a name chair, the same name chair as Salehammer, if you know what I mean by that. Um, and uh, he's like a leading Akkadian expert, like an expert in, in, he actually is one of the few people who actually can read Akkadian. <laughs> he's a biblical scholar there. This is a young earth creationist um, LCMS pastor <laughs> uh, from, that I met through the loop of the Ufen Seminary nearby who kind of came. This is Ken Turner. Um, and you can see also kind of sprinkled through here. Oh, this person right here is important. This is Alan Templeton. He's Jewish, but he's a secular population geneticist. He literally wrote the book on human evolution <laughs> and ended up endorsing my book. Right down here, um, you can see this guy right here. You see him? That's Nathan Lentz. He's an atheist who actually was part of this conversation. There was actually several atheist scientists that were engaged in this. So I had scientists, it was like a really cool experience having some of them in the same room. <coughs> some people couldn't actually make it in person. We had discussions about it. And what was able, really came out of that was surprising for a lot of people is that even the atheist biologists were really supportive of what this is because it's just good science. <laughs> and they could see this as being something that might be helpful for Christians. And I think what also happened is I found out that there was a large number of Christians that aren't in principle opposed to evolution. They have real theological objections to the way most people have made that resolution before. They weren't ready to just abandon an Adam and Eve. And they were kind of torn between a lot of uh, like this dilemma that turned out to be a false dilemma. What they were really looking to do is like, what's the, what's the best way to take hold of evolution? I'm not willing to do it until I can find a good way, and I haven't found a good way yet. <laughs> And a lot of them really um, have been very, very grateful and thankful. It's, it's a lot like what, what you were talking about, um, Tom. You know, there's just this real gratefulness. I would say both among scholars who are actually professionals and theologians, but then also just regular scientists out there that have been just struggling with this for years. So that was really gratifying. I'm going to briefly just talk about some of the responses, just briefly. We can maybe cover that in Q&A, and then we're gonna, I'm going to get a chance to talk a little more, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, you know, when you write a book, it's a lot of work. Um, 
and it's not actually aligned with my primary, it's not how I'm judged as successful as a scientist. I mean, I have to produce scientific papers. This isn't one of those scientific papers. So there's a certain amount of cost involved in this and also a certain amount of risk. How are my colleagues going to respond to it? When you do something like that, I, I think one of the most fearful things that could happen is that no one would care or read a book like this. <laughs> I was really fortunate, not only did people read it, uh, a lot of scholars have really engaged and taken this farther. I think what it's done is not really ended the conversation, it's created a new conversation. It's a conversation I think is really continuing going on now, it's a conversation you're really invited to, par to take part in. It's not just a conversation among academics, it's also a conversation in the church. So these are some of the books that really responded. One of the most important ones is by William Lane Craig. He wrote a book really engaging with a lot of the ideas in this. And he takes a different view um, for some reasons, and this is where a lot of the debate is now starting to shape up. Like, I mean, if we're going to go along with this evolution thing, what makes more sense? A recent Adam Eve, like I just discussed, or a more ancient Adam Eve in which the people outside the garden aren't fully human? Adam, I, I, you know, Bill Craig really thinks that a more ancient one makes more sense, and I disagree with him. I think, I think he, he's wrong on that. And um, that's a little bit trepidatious ground to be on, except for he's my friend. And I've definitely argued with him at ETS several times, and I think I won. <laughs> I'm kind of playing. I mean, he's a good friend, and, I, and I've done a lot actually scientific work to kind of help and support him. Another one, too, this is another book by a really important, I mean, this sometimes honestly feels like an American conversation, probably more than it needs to be. This is a question that's actually wondered about on the missions field a lot and in the global church. Andrew Loke reminds me of that every time. He's like a leading philosopher a religious philosopher who's based in Hong Kong. His family is from Singapore. He's written, he, some people call him the William Lane Craig of Asia, <laughs> uh, just because of his trajectory. And um, I was really, uh, you know, he, he actually added a contribution that kind of takes a mediated view between where Bill Craig is and where I am. Uh, and that's the book right there. I think what's particularly, I was really honored actually that he actually dedicated this book to me. Like I'm actually the one he dedicated the book to him. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's a first. That'll probably never happen again. <laughs> Um, John Garvey is like a biblical theologian. So these two come at it from a more philosophical pe perspective. From a more biblical perspective, I think people lean far more towards a recent Adam and Eve. Uh, John Garvey is a theologian in England that really kind of took this up right, um, right up as I was doing this. So I want to talk a little bit about this book from Reasons to Believe, and I think what's so important about it. So this is a book where they kind of lay out their objections to evolution and why they don't, they don't think it's true. The very last chapter of this book was written by AJ and was approved by one of Reasons to Believe too. And they say, and the title of it is something close to like, what if we were wrong? First of all, wouldn't it be great if a lot more books <laughs> kind of ended with the possibility that their main thesis was wrong? <laughs> There's like some serious humility there. And don't we need more humility like that in the origins conversation? I mean, I disagree with our reasons to believe about many things, but this is one of those things where I think they just kind of lead the way, and they really did here. And so they consider, what's the, what about if we're wrong and evolution's true? What will we do then? That's a hard question, right? Uh, to even just kind of ask that question and to even kind of do that self initiate And what they did is they actually went through and kind of explained what their key things are and said they would probably move to something that's really close to what I have in the genealogical Adam and Eve. And not only that, they thought it was really a view of scripture and an approach to it that they thought was entirely faithful and was completely aligned with their approach. Isn't that interesting that old earth creationists that reject evolution would be able to say that? <laughs> I think what's happened out of that, and there's also work that Ken Keithley as like a leading old earth creationist has really come forward with, what it's done is it's shown there's like a major restructuring, a shifting of the ground happening in the origins conversation. Um, where it's maybe not so much about the details about whether or not you affirm evolution or not is a really critical thing. It's more about particular theological beliefs that we have. And that's probably a better way to define this. So a lot of world earth creationists are saying, well, I'm not sure if evolution is true, but if you affirm a, a historical atom and with these sorts of criteria, that's not so much of a problem for us. So that's been the big shift that's happened. So Old Earth Creation is less defined by rejection of evolution. One of the more interesting books, too, that I'm going to be responding to really soon is like uh, Muslim scholars have picked it up. Um, several of them have and kind of been talking about it as this actually makes most sense as the Muslim option. And I know very little about Islamic theology. And I've been learning a lot and starting to be involved more in those academic debates, too. So that's, um, that's uh, kind of like the crazy journey I've been in the story. <laughs> And I'm sure you have a lot of questions. There's more to talk about. I really kind of just left a lot of breadcrumbs here in lots of different places, <laughs> if that makes sense, that you can pick up. And I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation with you. So thanks a lot.
I just say, you know, so we've got two, you're really thinking about two populations. You've got a population from, uh, comes from the garden, uh, Adam and Eve, okay, and then you have also this population that arose through evolution outside the garden, right, which is great. Uh, so the question is, what is the moral status of the people that are outside the garden? So Adam and Eve fell, so they're, they're, uh, they have the image of God, and they're fallen, but what about those uh, that are in the garden that arose through evolution? What's their moral status? Yeah, so what's the moral status of the people outside the garden? That's such a really good question. And there's many ways to answer it. I'm going to give you what I think is the best way, but I want to tell you that there are multiple ways. So what I'll, I'll even tell you where William Lane Craig comes, and he would say is those people outside the garden are in the very, very ancient past, like around 700,000 years ago. It wasn't recent. And they weren't fully human. So they don't have fully human minds. Um, I mean, maybe they're not precisely animals or what have you, but that, that, that's, they're not fully human. They don't actually have like full human language and that sort of thing. And, um, and, and he would want to kind of limit the amount of interbreeding between them. Um, and maybe kind of, if you go that far back, maybe you can even eliminate it to zero. That's one approach. I don't actually think that's one that makes the most sense. I think the one that makes the most sense is that they're actually biological humans that have the same, I mean, especially if they're recent, that we have very good evidence, they have the same sorts of abilities that, that we do. They're, they, um, they, would have, um, they would have the same you know, moral worth and dignity that we do, too. Uh, and I, I would even say that, both from textual evidence and how I think about the image of God, I would say they were also made in the image of God. <laughs> um, Adam and Eve are not, there's, I think the warrant for saying that Adam and Eve are the first in the image of God is really low. Um, I think that God made humankind across the globe in the image of God, and then at a later point, he kind of makes Adam and Eve, <laughs> who have this special role as the very first covenantal people, and they're made in the garden, and they kind of fall um, at that point. So I think that's the way to make the most sense of it. So they're fully human people that have the same role within dignity that God still loves, but they're kind of at a different point in God's redemptive story. They're really before the time of Adam. And, and we shouldn't see that means that they're less worth, uh, worthy or like not fully human. They just, they're in a different stage of covenantal history, not developmental or biological history. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, like I said, I think there's a range of possibilities. I just gave you what I think makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. So just, let me just come back with one more piece of that. And that is sort of thinking about uh, why would God do it this way? Why would God create human through evolution and then also have this population in the garden. Is there, is there some reason why, uh, scientifically, why you needed a larger population in order to, to have Adam and Eve be able to populate the whole earth? You see what I mean? So there's two questions there. One is yeah. why would God do it this way and what yeah. scientifically is making you say Yeah, that? I guess scientifically is a more interesting question. Well, so scientifically, um, we have pretty good evidence that there's people across the globe. Yeah. Um, like over the last, I mean, I, I don't think there's any debate about like over the last 100,000 years that it never really dips down to a single. It's, it's really thousands of people across the globe. Yeah. Um, and that's by several lines of evidence, not just genetic, though it's very clear genetically. Sure. Um, and um, you have to do a lot of backflips. Um, that I don't think ultimately work to try to come up with a different account of the evidence. Uh, most old earth creationists would agree with what I just said. Mm. Um, and then they, they would put Adam and Eve, before me, they would put Adam and Eve more ancient, and that's how they would think about it. Mm. Um, uh, but, uh, I mean, I, it, it's, it's just, you know, young earth creation has a lot of, I think, tensions with the evidence. This just, I don't know if this is the worst one. I mean, they have many tensions with many lines of evidence. This is just another one. Uh, that, that, that's there. It just, it looks really different than that. You know, a plain reading of evidence is that there was people across the globe. Mm. Um, now, why would God do it this way? Well, I would just say that God does surprising things all the time. And you might say, well, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, there's a lot, I, I wouldn't like save everyone by allowing my son to die. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you that with certainty. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I like you, but not that much. No. And, uh, I'm sorry. I love, I love my really, son more. I'm really disappointed, Josh. <laughs> and so that's not how I would save the world. I would find another way, but somehow that's not. I mean, so God doesn't do things the way I do. He sees death in a very different way than I do. He, he His approach to human value is very different. There's something 
that's familiar about him, but there's also something that's very different. And so I'm okay not knowing entirely. But um, on the other hand, one thing that you kind of see in this model, and why a lot, of, um, a lot of biblical scholars in particular are very drawn to it, is that it's not that this is a strange way of doing it. This actually makes you know, the story of Genesis, where the Adam and Eve in the garden, to look a lot more like the rest of Genesis, where it has God kind of having people, like you know, Israel, like, as like a chosen people that God kind of calls out of a larger one to kind of influence the rest of the world. And now Adam and Eve is fitting that same pattern in the mm -hmm. same way as before, as kind of being this, these, this, these two individuals that God is working through to have an influence on the rest of the world. And so it starts to really parallel that a lot more tightly. And I would also say that um, from a theological point of view, it starts to make the parallel between Adam and Jesus far more expansive and clear. Um, where, you know, it says that, you know, that there was the first Adam and there was the last Adam, right? But wait a minute. Or the last man, even. Like, Adam is like a synonym for man, right? Like, the last time I checked, I'm... I'm an Adam. I'm not one of the man. I'm a man too, and I came after Jesus. So what's being said there? It's not talking about you know just being a human, about Adam being the very first human, or um, or at least the first Homo sapien. They don't have a concept of that. It's I think what's going on here is that when that kind of comes up in First Corinthians, it's talking about there's this particular role that God had for Adam that is closely mirrored the role that God had for Jesus. And where Jesus succeeds is exactly where Adam failed. Where Adam failed is exactly where Jesus succeeds. And that's what I would think of it. So I think that, that actually kind of starts to make a lot more coherence of it. It's not actually foreign. It's not a foreign idea to scripture. It's not taught by scripture, but it actually kind of creates something that's actually a far more consistent story. Um, so uh, just to add to that, I'd say my book really argues that this is just possible theologically. It doesn't screw up everything. John Garvey's book, um, Generations of Heaven and Earth, that I put up there at the end, um, he, he goes far, but he basically says that the idea of people outside of the garden isn't merely possible. It's actually really helpful to theology. <laughs> it actually makes the whole thing make far more sense. <laughs> That's his argument. Um, which is kind of a, a cool thing to see if that's really true, right? I mean, if that, that, and, I, and, I, and I'm seeing it more and more. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm content if you're just wanting to say, okay, you haven't just broken anything important, and it's kind of confusing, but at least you haven't broken anything important. But I think some people are saying that maybe, I mean, Ken Keith has written this too. He's an old earth creationist in the Southern Baptist Convention, um, a pretty famous old earth creationist. He's kind of said, you know, this actually gives us, maybe gives us some new ways to approach some of the old uh, theological questions that came with the discovery of the new world. Great. Um, this gentleman over here, you want to uh, ask my a question? My training has been in theology, and of the five statements you made, three were about Adam and Eve, and two were about evolution. I have no problem what you said about Adam and Eve. Uh, evolution, uh, the first point you made, I have tremendous problems with theologically. And the second point that you made is an argument from silence from Scripture. There's no statement in scripture that would indicate there were people outside the garden. However, theologically, I don't see that as a major problem. But what bothers me about number four, the first one in your evolution, is, is, is the apes. And the problem with the apes is very simple. In Genesis 1, it says that God created human beings in his image. Mm -hmm. In the image of God, he created he them. Jesus Christ came to save human beings. He died on the cross for humans, not apes. He did not come for apes. He came for humans. And he rose again from the dead for the sake of human beings. And the promises are given to human beings of what those two events mean. And that includes, of course, his birth, coming, God becoming man, the God-man, in the first place. Uh, so so anything, anything that threatens uh, human beings created in the image of God, and apes do threaten that, is problematic. Uh, because well, so, so first of all, so, so, on, so, 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 so I heard you. So I want to just tell you all the things that I agree with you about. I agree with you, the majority of what you said. I agree anything that threatens the idea that we're made in the image of God is, is a major problem. <laughs> and there's two things going on here. Microevolution and macroevolution. Micro, I don't, I, as a Christian who's trained theologically, I have no problem with microevolution. 
uh, Darwin and you know the other stuff, it, it's scientifically proven, no problem. It's the macro jumping species that's the problem. Yeah, so, so first of all, remember I said in the beginning, <laughs> it's important. I didn't say I'm here to argue that evolution's true. We can discuss. I mean, if you really want to know why I think it, and people push me on it, I will kind of get. I mean, I, I have no problem. I mean, if you really want to know, I'll tell you. But my goal is not to convince you that evolution's true. I'm trying to ask you to imagine an imaginary science fiction world in which evolution's true. So maybe in our world, it's totally false and you can prove it. Okay, great. Um, that would be really cool to see a theologian make an argument that actually convinces biologists, but let's just say that that's true. Um, um, but you know, I'm talking about this in fictional world. World, it's a counterfactual world in which evolution is actually true. How would we make sense of the Genesis story? And um, I agree with you that we wouldn't want any solution that denies or undermines the idea that we're in the image of God. Um, so we're in complete agreement there. It's a very focused point of disagreement um, that I can, we can actually put a pinpoint on it. You think that if we share common ancestry, there's no way that we can be made in the image of God. I just don't think that that, that, that holds up to scrutiny. That, that, that's just maybe an assumption that there, that, that, that uh, I mean, we could, God could have created us. He could have created us from prior beings that weren't in the image of God and appoint, introduced changes if you want to, then that and kind of created a new species that was in the image of God. He can do that. He, he, he can do miracles. He can do that. If he can raise people from the dead, he can certainly do that. And if that's what he did, then what is the conflict? If God made us in the image of God, what's the problem? Well, for one thing, Genesis 1, the second thing to the end of, of all of what God has done in creation was the creation of animals, including mammals. <laughs> but then the creation of man, and it is separate. It's separate in the text. It's separate in the fact that he's now creating man in his image. He didn't do that for the animals. Sure. I don't think animals are in the image of God, to be clear. I also believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe the Bible is an errant, infallible, you know, word of God. And I really seek to find a way to think about this. It's aligned with historical Christianity. So there's so many things that we're on the same page. It's actually a very simple point where I'm just saying that um, we can affirm everything that you said is actually theologically important and recognize that there's a way to hold those things as true in a way that's actually consistent with common descent. Now, not everyone has thought that for a long time. And part of that actually is history, because it was that the first person who said that if common descent is true, then we're not made in the image of God was an atheist. It was Huxley in Man's Place in Nature. He argued that. And he had an agenda. Um, he's kind of like considered the first agnostic, but he's very anti-Christian. He had a very anti-Christian agenda. He intended to present human evolution in a way that was in direct conflict with core Christian beliefs, and chief among them was Adam and Eve and the image of God. So that ended up being how it was presented to the church. So a lot of people came away thinking, well, scientists are claiming that because we're, uh, you know, we share a common ancestry with the great apes, we're not made in the image of God. And now, if that were true, it, it would be a problem, except for I just don't think there's any reason to believe and trust Huxley's theology. <laughs> I would rather go with there's, the theology from Scripture. There's another aspect. If, if what someone believes that the Bible is God speaking to us and that it is reliable and inerrant and, you know, all the other infallible and all the other things, why would God do something that he doesn't communicate in, in the Bible? Why would it be something of silence that we come ultimately from apes. Why would that not even be mentioned? It well, because, because God does a lot of stuff he doesn't tell us about. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, it, it, like I'm telling you from a theological point of view, this is, that's actually probably the easiest part of this to think about. There are so many true things about the world that are not in scripture. Oh, of course, of course. But and so there's certain things that I mean, what he focused on, and we got to go to the next question soon too. Okay, so, but, all right. I'm, and I'm happy to talk to you. I'm not, I wanted to give you a lot of time because I want you to know that I'm not afraid of your questions, and I know that there's strong feelings here, and I wanted to take them seriously. Okay, but if you have more, I'm happy to talk to you more about okay. it. But I would say that. Um, 
Yeah, we, we can talk about that more. Um, but yeah, go ahead and let's get to the next question. Yeah, so I know you talked about the interaction of your work with other scholars, theologians, and academics. Um, I wanted to ask, like you mentioned William Lane Craig and you know some others. I wanted to ask, I'm a big fan of Dr. John Walton's work yeah. on this subject. Uh, you know, the lost world of Genesis 1, the lost world of Adam and Eve, the cosmic temple <laughs> hypothesis. And I just am curious, has there been any interaction with your work and his work? Because they seem to like to me like they would mesh together very well. Yeah, they do. Um, so I think it, I'd say there are some pretty big differences between our work, but I think, yeah, the, what he's talking about there, by the way, the idea of a cosmic temple is not John Walton's invention. <laughs> Right, right. That for long before John Walton, that's just become like the standard view of pretty much all exegetes across the spectrum. That's kind of it's like a consensus view at this point. I, I think a better account of the cosmic tentacle I personally found is actually in Greg Beale's work. There's a really good article called um, like the Eden, like the Temple of Eden. Sorry, the Eden, <coughs> the the Temple. And, and the church in the New Jerusalem, or the new, it's something about that, by Greg Beale. So I think it's a little more helpful because he's not so reliant on ancient Near Eastern literature. So I think the key thing that um, I think Walton did is kind of bring ancient Near Eastern literature to like the wider church to kind of start engaging it. Not that other people weren't doing it, but most of the people in the church hadn't really engaged that, right? Um, but I don't think you have to engage, actually, even with ancient Near Eastern literature to just see clearly from the text itself that the temple is really set up as a temple. I mean, the, the garden is really set up as a temple. It really is. And there's good reason to think that even that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are sequential, though there's a little more debate about that. And if that's the case, then um, that really starts to kind of convey the story that Adam and Eve are created um, with like a mandate to kind of spread the garden, spread God's presence across the entire globe. So yeah, it is, uh, it is a way to do it. So that, Walton's work is one approach to it. Um, Andrew Loke really relies heavily on him, but, but it's not the only one. I mean, there's, a lot, there's many different approaches you could take with that. Does that make sense? Yeah, could, who is the name of that one uh, other person that you mentioned? I wanted to add that to my to read list. What was that? Yeah, so it's Andrew Loke. No, no, the other. Uh, oh, Greg Beale. Greg Beale. B-E-A-L-E, -E, uh, Greg Beale. So the book is like Defending Inerrancy. Or a little version of Arancy, and so it's kind of defending. Yeah, that, that's that's his book. But there's that article that he wrote. Um, that's that's it's approximately Eden, the Temple, the Mission of the Church in the New Jerusalem. I believe it's approximately that as a title, and it's freely available online. I think it's really helpful when you actually see the textual reasons why people are drawing a connection between the Tabernacle, the Temple, and Revelation of the Church and the Garden. It's very hard to unseen. It makes sense of so many bizarre, weird parts of Scripture that we kind of just kind of blow by. Um, and, you know, th that's actually where there's a lot of coherence found in this idea that actually the, the Temple is echoing the 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 garden and it's kind of telling it's, it's kind of an uh, an image of a kind of like this new Jerusalem of heaven is kind of like what the garden becomes or could have become. Okay, thank. Uh, so it's, I'm agreeing with you, I guess. Okay. <laughs> so this is actually I, I'd say I'll just add to it. This is why a lot of um, a theologians have really been friendly to the direction I've been going on here because it's not actually a major revision of historical Christianity. I'm not saying you're all wrong, and we now know genetics and you have to change everything. It's no, actually, the stuff from genetics has been overstated. It actually means that a lot of stuff you've been thinking and coming into independently really just makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and, and you can hold those things and it's not in conflict with evolution. You can still doubt evolution if you want to. They can still believe it's all false, but you don't have to feel like it's actually in conflict, because it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's just like a, a harmless falsehood instead of such a damaging falsehood. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wow. So we're going to do uh, oh, there's one more question right here. Oh, there's a question online. Yeah, we're going to do an online question now. So, uh, if sin originated, this is it says, if sin originated in the garden, does that mean that this outside population was a sinless one? Yeah, it's funny. This came up today with the with your students from your class too, right? Hopefully, it's not one of them asking again because you know, <laughs> or maybe they, it's good because they want me to talk about it. So, first of all, scripture doesn't actually literally say the first sin begins there. I mean, historically in the Christian tradition, there's pretty strong awareness of the fact that you know 
the only fall out there wasn't just Adam's fall. You know, Lucifer also fell, and when did he fall? And a lot of people wondered about the idea that maybe he fell along before Adam and Eve. Also, in the actual text of Genesis itself, you can clearly see that, you know, it talks about it being Adam's sin, but clearly the serpent is sinning before Adam. And Eve is sitting before Adam, and yet it's called Adam's sin. So what, what's that? And it never actually says it's the first sin. Um, what it's rather saying is that there's something, is, is that that's Adam's sin really comes to affect us all in a profound way. There's something that carries more weight about Adam's sin. And I think Romans really helps us here a lot, too. You find out that there's many um, types of sin, even in the core passages in Romans 5, 12 through 14. Um, the same word harmatia that's being used there is, is sin being used in different senses. One of the core things there is that there's more culpability the more knowledge you have. Uh, and so uh, there's a distinction between that kind of ignorant wrongdoing where you're just violating your conscience potentially versus knowledgeable transgression of God's law. And the part of the point that Paul's making is that the reason the law came wasn't to actually reduce sin. It actually increased sin by making it so now we actually have this new ability to, to sin by breaking God's law. <laughs> and to make it more clear that we're all sinners, I mean, which is kind of like a, a surprising thought for a Jew, right? But then you think about it, it makes sense. If knowledge is connected to the culpability of our sin and the severity of our sin, which we know to be the case, right? Then, um, then like proximity to God, knowledge of God, his communication to us increases the severity of our sin when we're fallen people. And so I think what we can say is that if Adam and Eve are the first ones born in the perfect environment of the garment, the first ones who, even though other people have a sense of morals, maybe have a conscience, but they're the first ones that get this direct command from God that they go, well, it's interesting in the story too, Eve doesn't get the command, but Adam does. So this is another thing that's had theologians kind of infer that the key thing that's different about Adam's sin is he's the first one who's directly breaking an edict of God. So he might be the first transgressor, but it would be a mistake to say he's the first one who sinned. It's just that other sins weren't held against everyone's account in quite the same way. And so we become like the descendants that's, that are kind of deeply impacted by this very first transgression amongst our ancestors. Does, does that make some sense? Okay. So there's more questions there. Yeah, um, so in the theory in which Adam and Eve's descendants mixed with those who were almost human outside of the garden, um, looking forward to the future to when a human's genome could be modified, what do you think constitutes something as a human? So this really does get back to this question of what does it mean to be human? That's actually why I love this discussion of Adam and Eve. If you were here yesterday, weren't we discussing the same question about artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> it turns out that human, how we define human ends up being really critical to this discussion, and that's been neglected. People have generally assumed, well, everyone knows what a human is, and we all mean the same thing, which is totally nonsense. <laughs> it turns out that, uh, I mean, you know, you can ask scientists what a human is, and they'll give you many different answers. And it turns out there's no consensus in science. And not only is there no consensus, we don't actually have a way to actually arrive at a common definition. <laughs> and so we'll come to very different scientific answers based on what definition of human we use. <laughs> and then also, it, it's kind of like a crazy and ridiculous, frankly, assumption to think that the way that scientists use the word human and mean by human <laughs> has a tight correspondence at all with how theologians use the word human. <laughs> Why would we think that? Um, so I think what's going on is there's many different meanings of the word human. And so when you mean by on the view that they're not fully human, now you're talking about maybe like Bill Craig's sort of view, where they don't have like full human mind. So the way how he's defining human is to say like uh, maybe like a fully rational mind, um, like a full theory by and linguistic abilities in a body like ours. That's, that's approximately what he's saying. Um, it's, it's close to the definition that's being used by Catholics for like a rational soul. Um, and what he thinks is not merely if that's um, how to define human, that's also synonymous with being in the image of God. And Adam and Eve um, are the headwaters of, of the image of God in the human mind. And so it's really kind of that set of like three or four propositions that all have to be true at once to be able to deny human minds outside the garden, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so did that answer your question? Oh. Uh, so then what would you um, say then? What would be a human? Well, I, I say that there are many definitions of human, and you want to make sure you're using the right definition for the task you're talking about. So the key thing that I'm concerned about 
is the monogenesis tradition of the church. It's a tradition that says that one of the demands of orthodoxy is that we all descend from Adam and Eve. And so um, what's the right definition of human to, do, to use there is the question I'm wondering about. <clears throat> and I make a pretty extended case from different angles that I think the right way to understand the definition of human there is not actually as a definition of the human mind, but it's rather to use the theological definition for the purposes of this. I think in the context of the text, so out of that arises, is you have to understand it as Adam and Eve, their descendants, whom we believe to be extended across the entire globe. That's what I think is the right definition. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And so it's really just the descendants of Adam and Eve. And so we find out that that's what it means to be human by that. But that doesn't mean that other people aren't biological humans that have, a, that's what I'm trying to say. If we're trying to ask, do they have human worth and dignity? That's the wrong definition to use, I would say. We'd want to use a different definition of human to answer that question. So I'd say we just need to be much more, um, instead of collapsing them all and pretending they're all the same, we just need to accept that there's going to be very different definitions we use. We just need to make sure we use the right definition for the right question. That's how I would answer it. All right. Thank you. Let's go over here for a question. <laughs> Kind of developing off of his idea of what makes a human, he said that Adam and Eve came from the Garden of Eden, like somewhere between 6,000 and 5,000 years ago in that ballpark. No, I didn't say that. Oh, sorry. I was just looking at your calendar. You had I said that the earliest universal ancestors okay, um, of everyone in AD1 might arise as early as 5,000 years ago. But by 6,000 years ago, the majority of people across the globe are ancestors of everyone. So, that, that, that's, when, uh, so that's not saying when Adam and Eve arise. So that means that Adam and Eve, so if Adam and Eve were 6,000 years ago or any time more ancient than that, then we'd expect them to be ancestors of everyone. Oh, okay. So that doesn't tell you when they're, it just tells us they could be as early as 6,000, but they could be any time. <laughs> and I'd say, and what I said is probably, I'd say recent is less than 10,000 years ago. I was going to ask about um, segregated populations that have been yeah, for 60,000 years or such as North Sentinel Island or Amazonians, but I didn't realize that you were saying that it could go even more ancient than what you had on the... Yeah, so there's actually, this is discussed at length. This is actually the part of my book that received the most scrutiny from you know, people like Alan Templeton and you know, experts in population genetics. So, um, I couldn't have written my book in the 90s because we didn't know what we know now. We thought in the 90s, for example, that there was a lot of isolated populations, like long-term isolated. And you kind of named a few of them, like the Sengal Islands and like the Amazonians. What's happened is that we've actually gotten DNA from all of these places. And then we looked and we found out, oh, we thought they were isolated, but oops, they weren't. <laughs> Basically, everywhere we've had data to look, we found out that there was a lot of mixing and a totally unwritten history. And then you get that even more when you start looking at ancient DNA. There's been a major revolution in our understanding of, of human history, really, over the last 10,000 years. We found out all these places we thought were isolated were really not isolated. And so even that includes the Amazonian Basin. Now, the one place where there is some debate still is about, um, about uh, you know, uh, Tasmania. I can kind of get into details of it now. I don't really want to because it's a little bit technical. But the main thing is I don't think we actually have the data to tell for sure. Uh, to actually be able to, we, don't have, we haven't actually been able to get the data actually to look at that, for one. And then two, um, even if we can't detect it genetically, um, remember that the majority of our ancestors end up being genetic ghosts. So it's very hard to rule out that there wasn't any exchange, right? <laughs> And then actually, you can't really demonstrate that evidentially. So ultimately, some of these questions are start to kind of press into that area where it's really beyond what you know, evidentiary science can really tell us. Um, so um, what we can say is that with the exception of Tasmania, I think there's very good evidence, positive evidence, that there's mixing across the globe that makes that not an issue. In the case of Tasmania, there's some questions. But there's not like we've, we know for a fact that they were truly genealogically um, isolated. There's good reason to think that maybe they weren't. They were just relatively isolated. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. OK, we need to go to another one of the online questions. Uh, this one asks <clears throat> whether the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis, uh, whether it's really accurate due to either possible errors in translation of, Genesis, of the Genesis account or due to the fact that it was began as an oral tradition and then was written down. So, so, Sure. Yeah, so that, yeah. that's a really good question. So is it accurate? So I think, um, so Genesis has a redaction history. We can, you know, when we know that 
that it kind of had another form. I mean, like most people would say that it actually had a, it had a life as an oral story being shared and passed for a long time, right? I mean, that's whether you believe it's inspired or not. I mean, it really seems to have kind of that, those kind of that ring of being an oral story that was eventually written down. Um, so, you know, one of the questions I was wondering about, how long can oral histories actually be transmitted? <laughs> and it turns out there's actually scientific evidence about that. Did you know that? <laughs> So what they were able to do, there's a really, really interesting set of studies where they looked at um, um, myths and like stories being told and conveyed by um, Aborigines in Australia. And so they are, um, there's actually basically a continuous oral culture that goes back thousands of years there. So they never actually became a written culture, right? <laughs> Among them, some of their myths, they actually can accurately convey information around the underwater geography about, about land features that were actually buried about eight to 10,000 years ago. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> um, and, and so you just have to remember that like, oral cultures can convey information over thousands of years when they're important information. That's actually why these stories are told and retold. They're told to be memorable. They're told to be so like details that are, that are really important are conveyed. Um, and that's, and I don't think any of us think that those myths in, among the Aborigines were inspired. That's just kind of like how oral cultures work. And so that helps a little bit, right? <laughs> now then you add in the fact that, you know, I mean, I don't know what I would think about Genesis if I didn't, if I wasn't a Christian. The reason I'm a Christian isn't because of Genesis. I'm a Christian because I really encountered Jesus and I found out that he rose from the dead, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and I came to trust scripture because that's part of how I found Jesus. And I found out, you know, I kind of thought, you know, if Jesus really, if God really rose Jesus from the dead to make himself known, I don't think he fumbled the ball and just screwed up scripture entirely. I think he probably guide, guides those things. So when you kind of add that aspect in, there's reason to trust Genesis is, in, is, is kind of conveying important details that have been reliably understood by the church over the last 2,000 years. And so that's why I kind of think that, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's reasonable to say there's been changes. Um, I think it's very hard to determine which parts of it were, are kind of more, um, are just more kind of like the genre and being a bit more mythological expansions. I think it's a little bit hard to kind of tell that in some details. Like, um, even like in the uses of language, it's a little bit weird at times. I mean, like, for example, do you really think that the serpent was a snake? Because in the beginning of the story, I mean, we define a serpent as an animal that doesn't have legs, but in the story, the serpent actually has legs. So is that really a serpent? <laughs> There's like a category error happening here, right? <laughs> I don't think we need to say it as a, as a snake. And I think that'd be an example of something where there's kind of like a mythological dimension that even literalists will kind of see as, you know, kind of a mythological dimension. It's kind of hard to sort out those things. And I think we can all be okay with that. But then say that, you know, if Jesus really rose from the dead and we trust scripture is inerrant and infallible and the God's, you know, providentially guiding its formation and how it comes to us, that we can trust not only scripture itself, but also that it, the key parts of that story have been reliably picked up in the, in the Genesis tradition of the church. That's why, that's one of the key reasons why I'd say that I'm not merely looking for alignment with some superficial reading of Genesis. I'm also caring about alignment with historical Christianity because I want to read Genesis with the Church of All Believers, not merely on my own. Does that make sense? I'm giving a lot of explanation of the kind of the theological approach I'm taking to scripture to that question, because I think it's a very good question, and I wanted to tell you a little more where I'm coming from on that. I go ahead. Um, I guess this is more of a genetics and genealogy question, and I don't know if this is quite in your wheel, wheelhouse with your research, but um, is there any genetic or uh, genealogical evidence uh, to support um, the biblical flood, flood, basically? And that's kind of a uh, little kind of similar to like the last kind of explanation of like mythology and you know uh, multiple uh, cultures from across the world and other types of pantheons and uh, religions have uh, a flood myth. So I was just wondering, I was just curious to see if there's anything in your research that you did that supports that or kind of- Yeah, so that, that's something where I find two things that are really interesting. Okay, so first of all, you have to just understand that um, all the evidence I said about kind of seeing the population is really large going back, it, it doesn't dip down to eight people either, okay? It's, it's thousands of people and there's like large lines of evidence for that. 
so that kind of undermines um, kind of like this very modern reading that the flood extends across the entire globe and destroys anyone. There's only eight people living. But that's not literally actually what I think Genesis is saying. It really seems to be saying that um, the people in that, in that area, like the descendants of Adam, that's what it's literally saying, in that area end up being kind of destroyed or displaced. It's not talking about Australia. So I, I think, you know, it's not surprising that actually the majority of fundamentalists 100 years ago were actually very comfortable with the idea of, um, of, a, of a, a regional flood. But that doesn't explain this other problem, which a lot of young creationists bring up. Well, wait a minute, there's myths of floods across all these other, other um, parts of the world. Um, but um, before I get to that problem, I'll just say that one of the surprising things I found about this is something called the Persian Gulf Oasis. So there's a paper written in 2010 by Jeffrey Rose where uh, he, he basically looks at kind of the origin of civilization and what was going on in the Persian Gulf um, over the last you know, 10,000 years or like 20,000 years. And he, and he kind of was able to show, and there's very good evidence for this now too, is that around you know, 10,000 to 8,000 years ago, the seas rose about 400 feet. I mean, they've kind of been going up and down with the glacial periods, but then there was like this kind of sharp transition where the glaciers go down a lot and like the sea level goes up 400 feet across the globe. Across the globe, did you catch that? And, um, and so before that time, the Persian Gulf wasn't a gulf, it was an oasis, because it was below aquifer level, there's um, fresh water coming up out of the ground, there wasn't, it was a kind of a very, airy, air, very arid area without rain, but still that there was like this lush, vegetation and all that because of like the aquifers. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what happens is as soon as the waters rise, that's when he starts to see cities arising around 8,000 years ago, right along the, on, on the shores of, of the Persian Gulf. So he's saying actually most likely it's civilization starting in the Persian Gulf oasis. And that gets destroyed by this rising of the seas. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and so this is like a, a truly catastrophic flood that happened that destroyed like early civilization in that area and kind of caused that. And so that, that, that's definitely very evocative. But the important thing about that too is um, that was probably not, I mean, that was also a global event. So it didn't cover all of the, um, all of the, um, the uh, mountains, but it dramatically altered the geography across the entire globe. And at that time, actually, humans were often very close to the shore because there was like fish there, there was fishing, and like a lot of dispersal was happening along with boats along the ocean. We have like, we actually can have like uh, um, boats that, like still intact from 10,000 years ago. Isn't that cool? But there's also really good evidence of, of boats going back uh, at least 60,000 years ago because it take it requires boats to get from New Guinea to Australia when that's populated. And so we know that there's actually boats going on, and that's where a large part of the human population is. And that's where the first cities are rising across the globe if they're forming, right? And then across the globe, 400 feet rise in a fairly short period amount of time. And so, yeah, so this is going to be something that kind of leaves a strong impression in a lot of places. So I think there was a global flood. It just didn't cover all the mountains. And that did get kind of expressed in several myths, including like in Aborigines and Australia and in India and these places. But I think it's more having to do with um, that rising of the seas, uh, which turns out to be within the horizon of oral traditions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great answer. So let's take a question over here. So you said that um, like the people outside of the garden were like evolved from like the like apes like they share the common ancestor with that. If they were to evolve, but you said that at one point they could have been like evolved before Adam and Eve were created. How does that fit into the seven day like creation theory? Like does that does that mean you believe that the seven days were not actually like a day and that it was like? Oh, I'm actually inclined to see them as ordinary days. This is when actually it was kind of funny talking to students because um, they thought I was taking a day age approach, but I actually kind of think that seeing them as ordinary days makes a lot of sense. So um, I just don't think that tells you the age of the Earth because um, clearly the Earth exists in Genesis 1 verse 2 when the Spirit of the God is over the waters of the Earth before the first day, which is several verses later. I think the Earth actually, like the planet Earth pre-exists day one. 
Um, and if that sounds crazy, this is not actually a new idea at all. This is actually the most common view among fundamentalists. If you ever heard of the Schofield Bible, <laughs> um, like before 1960, this was the dominant view in the American church. So um, is the idea that it's something called the gap theory. And there's many sorts of gap theories. Some of them have very bad hermeneutics, but some of them don't. And, and it's, you can take them as six days. That's not a problem. It's not really about how long those days are. It's just, it's just kind of silly to think. I mean, it's not consistent with a literal reading. Let's put it that way. To think that that gives you the age of the planet, the Earth, when it never even references the planet Earth. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, w at what point do you think these like outside humans evolved from monkeys or apes or whatever? And how long were Adam and Eve living in the garden before they were like kicked out? Well, that's a good question, too. So I don't think the text really clearly tells us, but there's a lot happening in Genesis 2. It's a little bit hard for me to see that all being compressed into a single day. All right. So one view is to say that Genesis 2 is kind of expanding on what happened in day six. Right. And then it's, it's pretty ironic, too, because a lot of times people would try and take the um, day uh, one through six as literal 24-hour days or like ordinary days. Then they'll say that day seven was an age. <laughs> God rested, right? <laughs> That's one of the big ironies in the whole thing. The six days are, are six 24-hour days. What about the seventh day? <laughs> Why isn't that one a 24-hour day, too, right? Um, so that, that's one approach, but I'd say what makes, what I, what I think is it's probably what's happening in Genesis 2 is more than one day. I think it happens fairly quickly. I don't think that they're kind of there for an indefinite, like millennia sitting there hanging out in the garden, not sure what's going to happen. I think they screw it up fairly quickly. <laughs> I mean, just maybe not in, in you know, like a 12-hour day. <laughs> um, it's probably multiple days is what I'd suggest. Um, and I think the right way to look at it is first of all recognize that at least from a narrative point of view that there's a difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. These are two different accounts and we have to decide what's the relationship between these two. Um, and many Christians will say that what's going on, like once again, is that Genesis 2 is kind of expanding on the details that happened in, in day 6. I've kind of already pointed out some things that kind of are a little weird about that. <laughs> I think a far more defensible position, though you can disagree with me and my theory still holds. So there are several people who disagree with me but still like what I'm doing. <laughs> They'll just say, he's wrong about that, but this kind of but that, but this kind of works. Uh, and so you can make it work even if you disagree on the sex or general point. But I'd say I think there's a there's a pretty strong case to be made that Genesis one happens. Day seven is an uh, ordinary day two. So it's day one through six are ordinary days, and day seven is an ordinary day two, and then Genesis two is kind of picking up on the eighth day. And so it's sequential. So it's like the temple inauguration, and then now God kind of makes the priest to be in the temple. Uh, I mean, that's how John Walton reads it. I mean, it just makes a lot of sense to me, um, and that makes more narrative flow. It's like a far simpler reading. Of it. It's a far more literal reading of the text. Um, so it's, it's a, I mean, that, that just works for me. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. But of course, some people will think differently about this. <laughs> and that's OK. You're allowed to disagree with me, by the way. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll take one last question over here. Um, so before I ask my question, I just want to preface it with, um, I grew up going to a Catholic school for like, a uh, private Catholic school for several years and we had to take like theology and religion classes as a requirement. Um, and then also, um, I agree with what you said about like science and religion can be combined into one thing that agrees that they can agree on things. Um, but over time, through my experience with religion, I've, I've had some questions over time, including the story of Adam and Eve, but um, isn't it reasonable to take the, the Bible in a metaphorical sense? And I know that not everyone sees it that way, but I mean, when you consider, uh, I forgot exactly what they were called, but there were several meetings of religious leaders in the past who, uh, came together to discuss what should and shouldn't be in the Bible. And like when you take all of these things into account from translations to like the previous question said, like translations, uh, oral traditions, um, these gatherings for what should and shouldn't be out, uh, even sometimes based off of the current uh, culture of the time. It's, is it reasonable to assume that some of the things in the Bible, including the story of Adam and Eve, can sometimes be taken with a bit of a grain of salt? 
Um, well, you've kind of put several different things. So let's start with yeah. what you said initially, right? So is it reasonable to say it's metaphorical? I wouldn't even just say it's reasonable. I think we should read it as metaphorical, too. The big debate is not about whether or not we can read Genesis metaphorically, because everyone should read it metaphorically, too. The question is whether or not we should deny a historical component to it. So even if you think Adam and Eve are literal, it would be a big mistake to just kind of see this as some sort of flat historical account with no um, symbolic archetypal meaning there, too. So there is a layer to the text that has that. that. That is certainly an important layer, and you've really missed something important. And I, and I think it's a little bit naive to think that that's actually what literalism means. <laughs> or, you know, that what, what the, the big fight has been is that some people have said that science shows us that it can't actually have a historical referent. That's a false claim. And that, um, that it can only be taken as metaphorical, and that preserves all of the key components of it. OK. So can you take it metaphorically? And not only can you, I'd say you should kind of look at that layer. But it's a big mistake, and it's a misunderstanding of the science to think that there's some sort of reason to deny a historical referent. And I would say, if we actually understand how myths work, I mean, that kind of raises and heightens this question even more. Look, I mean, there's bits about the founding of Rome by Romulus and Remus, like, you know, half wolves, right? Um, those are myths that most of us believe have some pretty strong mythological elements that didn't actually happen. Does that mean and then follow that Rome is a myth and it never existed? No. <laughs> There's all these myths surrounding, you know, the the Trojan War, you know, and uh, you know, and Odysseus kind of coming back. But you know, we have really good reason to believe that there really was a Trojan War, even if we don't think that you know Zeus was throwing down thunderbolts and you know, and uh, all of that stuff is there. There's there's a component. There's actually in, in most myths there is a real true historical reference. Um, sometimes we can't always parse out what it is. There can be debate. There can be legitimate debate about how much of it um, is referent or not. But I'd say kind of like the grand church tradition, kind of across many different denominations, has just always seen a lot of uh, importance in a historical fall arising from an original couple. A lot has to change in Christianity if that's not true. And I guess I'm willing to go there if that's really what the evidence you know, really demonstrates. If that, it's really what we're pushed to. But the evidence doesn't show that. So why would I make any of those changes is maybe more the approach I would take. And so yeah, let's read it metaphorically. But we shouldn't think that that somehow diminishes or denigrates the, like the, the, the real historical possibilities of actually being real people in a real past.